Did he get the rest of the class to answer? Yeah. I'm sorry I missed the mention of my name yesterday <laughs> in your uh, Reformation class. You did. Oh, I see. Offerings the church could have for old people. Okay. Well, that was a good meeting to be in. Okay. How did you answer my question? You'll just have to go watch the video. That's my favorite. <laughs> well, it was like a 10 minute answer, so. Hello to all of our friends online. Can you guys hear me at all? Yes. Okay, good. Great. Uh, it'll be even clearer in a minute because I, I don't have the speaker on just yet. So Thank you. I really appreciate it.
Um. <laughs> Okay, all right. Well, okay, greetings, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> Good to be able to be with you. Um, can everybody hear me all right? Is that working? Okay. All right, good. Well, uh, it's good to be back with you. I'm sorry we missed last week. Um, I had a relatively mild case of COVID, um, but I'm happy to be back um, in the saddle. So uh, we are back together for session 12. Um, just to remind you, uh, we will, of course, be meeting next week, but then the week after, which is President's Day, uh, the building is closed for a federal holiday, so we won't meet that week, and then we will resume uh, after that. All right. Well, let me say a quick word of prayer, and then uh, we'll jump in together for session 12. All right. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for um, the gift of life, the gift of study and reflection, fellowship. Thank you for scripture and the witness that it is to us, the way that it points to you, the living God. Open our hearts and our minds, we pray, that we might hear your word and sense your presence and know how we are to live in this day. We ask and pray you be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, we are in, in our study of Acts, um, and this is session 12. Uh, we are just entering into chapter 10 um, in our in our study of the book of Acts. Um, I am going to kind of, without too much delay, because we do have a fair amount of material we want to try to get through today, uh, jump in to sort of remind us of where we were last time we gathered together um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, can everybody see this? A little bit. Really. You might, you might want to pull those down just behind you. I think they might, that might do a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> um, our last session uh, was taken up with uh, concluding a discussion of one of probably one of the most famous or well-known uh, passages in the book of Acts, which is the, um, the conversion of Saul, uh, which happens... I should turn this on for it to work for me, uh, which happens in chapter nine, and, and of course his Damascus Road uh, experience. We had we had talked about the Damascus Road experience uh, a week prior to that, and then uh, we concluded our discussion 
uh, with Saul. And, um, and I think the point, of course, uh, what we want to sort of remind ourselves is that we've entered into pretty much since chapter eight, a series of, <clears throat> um, and I don't know, expansions maybe is one way of thinking about it, um, as the spirit has expanded uh, the realm and the expectations really probably of the early Christians, all of whom are Jewish, all of whom have probably particular Jewish expectations about the promise of the Spirit, inclusion into God's promises and those kinds of things, only now to have, you know, first Samaritans, what? Hey, bring Samaritans in here. Uh, then to have folks from the other end of the world, right? The Ethiopian eunuch. All of a sudden now, the principal chief enemy, right? Um, someone who in some ways embodies the, the will, the violent will that Jesus experienced from the Sanhedrin, right? I mean, uh, Saul even goes to get letters from the chief priests to take it to Damascus uh, so he can round up people there, etc. And so now one of God's fiercest enemies is now um, brought in, right? Essentially converted, changed, transformed. Uh, and so we see this circle, that, that God's circle is widening in such a way that um, it's pretty remarkable, right? And, of course, the chapter we're going to enter into now uh, widens it uh, as far in a sense as it can go, at least in terms of human uh, uh, life uh, from a Jewish perspective. Um, one of the things that we also noted, um, and I think this is important as part of the story, is as God widens, as God does things, people who are in the know are not always comfortable with it, right? So uh, what we see, uh, and we only see a little bit of it, um, is, uh, you know, Saul, first of all, there's a man named Ananias who's not really sure that God knows what, you know, Saul is up to. Uh, says, well, wait a minute. Are you sure you want me to go lay hands on this guy? Isn't he the one that's been trying to murder people? Uh, so, yes, of course, God knows what he's up to. Um, and he goes and he does that. Um, the Damascus Fellowship, it sounds like, embraces him. He stays with them. But then when he goes to Jerusalem, they're not sure about him. And uh, we don't know. Of course, we talked about how uh, there was a series of, of verses, probably five or six verses that may have traversed about three years or so. So in terms of the time frame, a pretty long one. So here are the people, though, in charge, in a sense, right? People um, uh, uh, in the leadership, in, in the know, um, who are not quite there yet. And that's what we're going to start to experience even more now with the episode we're about to share. Uh, in fact, it's going to take three whole chapters, really, um, to, to work through some of this. And I think even by the end of the uh, one of the chapters, if we take Paul's letters, as sort of part of our data, we're not really going to draw that in. We know that even towards the end of his life, there was still a lot of controversy surrounding his mission and witness to Gentiles. Um, after the explosive fireworks, um, inspiring story of Saul's conversion, we then get a, a kind of an interlude. Um, it talks about, you know, Saul had been in Jerusalem pretty much doing the same things he'd been doing in Damascus, which is preaching in the synagogues and really upsetting uh, his opponents to the point where they wanted to move from debate to murder. Uh, and so they shipped him, they ship him off uh, from Jerusalem. And at the very end, it tells us, very end of chapter eight, I think it is, it tells us that the church experiences peace. Um, and then we get these two episodes, these short episodes in the middle there to sort of outline you know, what, what does that look like? And that has to do with the, the healings of Aeneas and Tabitha. Aeneas, of course, is healed. Tabitha is raised from the dead. Uh, and we talked a, a little bit about the, sort of the significance of this um, and putting it in the context, at least of the overarching story. <laughs> I think it is, it does fit well as a way of thinking about what does it mean that the church is experiencing both peace and growth? Uh, both of those events uh, lead to the church growing, is what the text tells us. Um, and we can read into each episode different things, I think, um, uh, uh, to, to a good effect. We then came basically up to the doorstep of chapter 10. 
That's where we stopped last time. And I, I had a, a sort of a lengthy introductory um, panel that I wanted to walk through for you. And I, I really wanted, this is one of those places where uh, we do want to pause, I think. Uh, you know, there's, there's going to be some chapters that we're going to move into later on that we're just going to literally fly through because it's basically like Paul walks from one place to another to another. But this is one of those places that's worth pausing because of how radical, really, it is. It, it, it really means a, a complete transformation in a certain sense, uh, certainly of demography of the early church, but also of the promises that you find in, in the Hebrew Bible. I mean, many of the promises that you find are quite explicit that they are only to the people of Israel. And what do we find? God has expanded that, has, has, has opened that up to include all the nations, which is what the Gentiles are. So we talk about this. I, I, I kind of highlighted it under three headings, that this was a revolutionary process, right, a complete and, and by revolution, I simply, I, I really do mean like a, a complete and total transformation of the way that the church would have seen and understood itself. Um, because it's a revolutionary process, it's also a, dis a profoundly disruptive process, right? Uh, and I mean disruptive, probably not just on the ground, um, but how people thought and saw the world, thought about um the significance, importance of Jesus, who he was really for. Was he only for the Jews? Was he only for a select number of those Jews? Or, which is what the narrative sort of seems to tell us, was he for everyone? Uh, and that's kind of a, that's a huge shift because it will affect not only the way you see the world, but how you live in the world. And then the last thing is uh, we wanted to underline um, and I, I'll do this as I move through, but I really wanted to highlight this is not a church growth strategy. <laughs> no one sat in the back room and thought, hey, we need to find ways to increase our numbers. Let's open up the doors to all the Gentiles, yada, yada. Um, no one said, um, I'm going to be a rebel, and I, I'm going to do what the church doesn't want me to do, blah, blah, blah. No, that's not what we find. What we find is that the Spirit is the one doing the challenging work, and everyone else is trying to catch up, including the people that are central to the drama. As the story we're going to see unfolds, Peter is a central character, and he is he is almost not convinced of what he's doing. Um, and I think if you read again later on, we follow Paul's letters, we go up into chapter 15, we find that Peter struggles with this for a while. It doesn't just resolve itself. So when the spirit is acting in this way, oftentimes the church is dragging its feet. Uh, and I think that's one of the, this is one of the great uh, uh, messages, really, of the book of Acts. Okay. So let's transition then into our passage. Can I get a volunteer who's willing to open us up and read our initial verses here? <clears throat> Yeah, please, please. <laughs> I think she was just in time. That's right. You came just in time. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? He answered, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who's called Peter. He is lodging with a certain Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him. And after telling him everything, he sent them to Joppa. I want to make an, uh, a comment about this because when we were on the trip to the Holy Land, and or more years ago, we were in Jaffa, and they pointed out that particular house where this happened. Quite 
Amazing. Very interesting, yeah. And if we if we had time, we would also want to highlight you know, that Joppa is associated with Jonah, who God, whom God sends to other Gentiles, uh, right, to preach a message that will ultimately lead not to their destruction, but their salvation. Uh, but that's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Here we go. Um, so uh, as a reminder, uh, chapter 10 and 11, they kind of, they go together, all right? And we're not going to get into chapter 11 today, but basically our entire sort of story here spreads itself over two chapters. Um, in uh, this very opening part, let's have some trouble here. He keeps going in and out of the thing here. Um, I think I mentioned to you before that there's something like 18 um, that constitute the whole of this story, this, this whole episode from chapter 10 uh, up into 11. Here, chapter 10, verses 1 through 16, um, we have sort of the two parallel vision scenes uh, together. So uh, we just heard, uh, read the first eight verses. Uh, the second eight will be a companion. So whatever we say here runs almost quickly into what's coming next. So first of all, we're introduced to um, our first main character of this uh, scene, basically just kind of story uh, that we're going to hear about over the next couple of chapters, uh, a man named Cornelius. Um, and I'm not going to reread those first two verses, but what they tell us, uh, in a sense, is that Cornelius is not an ordinary Gentile. Um, he is, uh, there's a few things that we can say about him. Uh, one is uh, we're told that he's a soldier um, and uh, is a relatively, you know, not a high, I, I don't know if a high ranking, but is a, a man of rank. Uh, so the way he's described here would make him a commander or leader of a hundred men um, portion uh, of a garrison uh, there in, uh, in the city of Joppa. Now, as I mentioned here, I think this is important that he's a soldier because soldiers, right? Roman soldiers would have been seen as occupiers. They would not have necessarily been seen favorably, but he's a soldier. And from the, what the rest of the text tells us, he's a righteous person. He has not misused the authority that, he's, that he would be responsible for. Uh, so he's, he's in some ways an anomaly perhaps uh, to what we would expect and what we encounter in other places uh, in the New Testament. He's also described, um, well, we've got a lot of folks come, trying to get in here. And uh, unfortunately, Cliff keeps getting kicked out. He's also, I think, uh, de deductively what we have come to call God, a God-fearer. Um, so there's a third category that scholars use to describe uh, Gentiles who were deeply attracted to the traditions uh, of Israel. They probably um, visited and uh, participated in synagogue services. They might have uh, kept Shabbat. They might have, or, you know, they might have um, eaten kosher. They might have even kept other festivals. The only thing they didn't do was to go to the final step and 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 go undergo circumcision uh, to become fully Jewish. So Cornelius, in other words, is not just a Gentile out there in the world with no connection whatsoever. We're going to encounter some of those folks later in the story. He is, though, a, he is, of course, a Gentile, and he's not a member yet of the house of Israel. Um it also tells us that he gave his alms uh, to the people. He's described, in other words, as I mentioned here, in language that's actually quite similar to the language used to describe Tabitha. And if you remember, Tabitha was a very significant figure um, uh, in the community in which she was in. And I think it's in Lydda. Or jo was it Joppa or Lydda? I can't remember. I guess it was Joppa, actually. Um, and uh, uh, so here is a God-fearer, someone who would be thought to be outside, nevertheless, looks an awful lot like a potential disciple, right? Um, the text then tells us about his vision. It says, uh, starting in verse 3, 
One afternoon at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? He answered, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. So a couple things to say. Number one, um, uh, Cornelius is uh, at, at three o'clock. This is the time of prayer. Right? This, is what, this would have been one of the Jewish hours of prayer. That's what this is. So he's in prayer and he has this vision. All right. Um, and the second thing we want to note is um, who instigates this? The Spirit. So much like the work of the Spirit and its instigation and sort of its um, beginning the process and maybe bringing the process to an end with the Ethiopian eunuch, we have that same kind of thing, a divine intervention, essentially, right? The, the Spirit has to break in and guide this and push this forward. And then the last thing to note, um, Cornelius, in a sense, is very lucky compared to Peter uh, because his vision doesn't take a lot to decode. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. It's like a straightforward set of instructions. It actually reminds you of the vision that um, uh, Ananias has about going to see Saul. It's like, go to this guy at this hour on this street at this door. And, and that's pretty much what you get here uh, for Cornelius. So very straightforward. Doesn't really uh, require decoding in the way that we're going to see that Peter's does. And I think perhaps the reason for this is that what's being asked of Cornelius is not as much of a leap, right? It's simply to do a certain thing, a certain kind of task, um, the repercussions of which uh, are not as enormous as they will be in some ways for Peter. What, is, what do we find? Um, Cornelius uh, um, is, like many uh, characters in, uh, in Scripture, uh, he is immediately obedient. Right? So he immediately obeys, and this is a mark of a righteous person. So we're not surprised. We've already heard that, this, that Cornelius is essentially a righteous person, cares for those around him. He does not misuse his authority, right, et cetera, et cetera. So this doesn't necessarily surprise us. When he does respond, we find out a little bit more about Cornelius, one of which is that not only is he a soldier entrusted with authority, but he probably is also a person of some means. Right? Because he has slaves, et cetera, which, of course, is troubling, I think, for us in our own mind and day and age. But this would have certainly been a mark uh, of wealth or status. I think, and uh, at this point, you know, in, in, in thinking about this question of his status, I raise this question here. You can't help but wonder what is Cornelius himself going to have to give up um, when he enters into this community of faith? We don't know, right? Uh, as far as I know. Uh, there certainly are, there might, perhaps there are traditions about Cornelius, uh, but I was not aware of them uh, after pulling this together. All right, so here we have then Cornelius. He has a vision. He immediately responds uh, to the instructions in the vision. That's part one. Now part two. I get a volunteer as well to read our next set of verses. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. <clears throat> trance. He saw the heaven open and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles, birds of the air. And then he heard a voice saying, Get up. Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The boy said to him again a second time, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing suddenly taken up to heaven. All right. <laughs> okay, so if Cornelius gets a straightforward vision, Peter, in some ways, does not, right? Um, all right, so 
these these visions and the visionary experiences actually parallel each other in pretty interesting ways. One of those ways is that Peter now also is depicted at prayer. Um, around noon, noon is also one of the times, one of the hours of prayer. Um, in his praying, in his work of prayer, which is, would have been understood as a work, a task, something that you put your whole mind, heart, and body uh, into, um, he uh, begins to develop an appetite, right? As it says here, um, he, uh, he becomes hungry uh, while praying. And of course, the implication there is that the work of prayer is not, um, is, is actually work, right? It's something that, that takes concentration. The text then tells us, right, that he falls into a trance. So, uh, and here's, here's his, his vision, uh, starting in uh, verse 11. He saw the heaven opened. Ah, all right, Once heavens, when heaven opens, right, that means God is, something is going to happen. Uh, something's been opened up. And something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. I'm going to stop there for just one second and say, because that, you know, we have this very interesting picture here. And so we, we fall, Peter falls into a trance, sees a vision, but the vision here is completely unclear to Peter. He does not understand in some ways the meaning or the implication, or he reads the meaning and implication of what he hears very differently. He is not going to respond um, quite as immediately as perhaps uh, Cornelius does. Now, one of the things that's kind of interesting about this vision, and uh, when I was kind of moving through doing the commentating, uh, commentators, I'm sure they've been asked these questions before, which is, well, why why doesn't God just like straightforwardly, you know, why why are you, why are why is the vision made up of a bunch of animals when the issue is about welcoming Gentiles? Like, what's going on here? And there's probably a couple things. Number one is that it does appear uh, that in the ancient world, certainly, um, uh, the question of whether or not you were going to eat with someone else, this was a huge demarcation for Jews and Gentiles. So it makes sense in a way that that was what was going on. The other thing that I thought was interesting and worth at least keeping in mind is Peter's own location. Where is he? He's on the seashore. He, see, he can see ships sailing by. And what do ships have? They have sails. And what does it sound like is coming down out of heaven? A giant sheet, probably something like a sail, right? Um, and what's on that? All kinds of animals. Who's he staying with? A tanner. What did tanners do? All kinds of different animals to make leather from their skin, right? So it's possible that the location where he is becomes the stuff that God decides to use to convey this vision. I mean, that's an interesting thing, I think, uh, uh, to keep in mind, sort of the contents of the vision. The second thing that's kind of peculiar um, is that the text tells us there are all kinds of animals here, which means that Peter could have picked an animal that was kosher, potentially. His response could have been that, but his response is not that, right? It tells us starting in verse 13. Then he heard a voice saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. All right. This vision, right, it's, it's again, even, even us being able to read it, you know, and knowing kind of where this is going, it's still op very oblique, right? It's very much to the side. Like, uh, you've got to sit with it, really, I think, to get it. So it, 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 you can't really blame Peter totally, I think, for being kind of unclear. Obviously, we're, 
the, the, the motor of the vision has to do with dietary restrictions. Peter's response certainly picks up on that. As he says, I've never eaten anything unclean. Um, the, the response of Peter, I, I describe it here as uh, essentially a refusal. Right? He's being given a command, and he refuses this command. And in fact, the way that he posits his refusal, he seems to see it as some kind of potential trap. Right? I mean, is this is this a test? In other words, a testing vision. Perhaps that's what it is. Um, and and uh, and I have here, of course, again a question mark um, around that. What I say here is that it so clearly goes against what he knows about the law to be told to eat whatever he wants. That's not lawful, or at least that's not the way he would have understood the law. But there's something deeper at work here that, of course, we're being given or we're sort of privy to, and Peter himself is going to become privy to, which is uh, that underneath, in some ways, uh, some of those dietary legal restrictions there is a deeper affirmation of life, right? There is, uh, underneath that sort of what feels like exclusionary, there is actually an inclusive element uh, at play. So Peter, understandably, has a hard time coming to terms with this vision, and it has to be repeated three different times, all right? That's what the text tells us. And of course, uh, the number three, uh, typically symbolically refers to um, the time that is needed for something to occur or to transpire, right? A fullness of time uh, almost is, is uh, a way of thinking about this. So it has to be repeated three times. Uh, and as I mentioned here, that typically refers to a, an amount of time or a duration uh, uh, for something to come to pass. What we're going to find out in just a second is that even after all the time that is needed, three times, Peter still puzzles and doesn't know what this vision means. Right? He still can't quite put it together. And he's going to have to live with this vision. In other words, he's been given a dream, he's been given a vision, but he doesn't know what it means yet. Right? Let me stop there and see uh, what kind of comments or questions uh, you might have before we move ourselves into the next. You know, and I know we've got a bunch of people here online as well. I've been uh, in another class on Revelation, and there's four angels that come down. Revelation has been revolving as well. It's quite interesting. Sort of the, the sweet thing here. Yeah, they're holding the four corners of the earth. The, the encompassing of the yeah. whole. Interesting. I think right. I saw the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or the sea. All right. <laughs> Other comments? Yeah. I immediately thought about the uh, yeah, Christ said to them before the cock goes twice down the behind us, right? And here is three times we came down three times and we were doing the first one. So the, the three times kind of paralleling his Peter's own three times the, the betrayal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean that this symbolism uh it definitely echoes in different places and you know, one of the great things about Peter as a character, at least in the New Testament, is how earnest he is, but also how bumbling sometimes, you know, because he doesn't always, he's earnest, but he doesn't always kind of understand exactly what he's doing. Um, and, uh, you know, makes you feel good, really. <laughs> We're not alone, right, in, a, uh, in our attempts to try to follow after Jesus. What about our friends on uh, online? Anybody online? Uh, any comments? Questions? No? All right. All right, I'm going to move us forward then. 
as uh, things pick up steam. So can I get a volunteer as one? Okay. Particularly in the second paragraph in Greek, that it's, I don't know that it's captured as well in the English, uh, and I'll kind of get back to that in just a moment. But um, so in verses 17 through 20, um, just before Cornelius uh, arrives, um, I, I think it'd be fair to say that Luke sort of um, draws out what we've just heard about the vision, right? Because we're told twice in those three verses. That Peter is puzzling over this vision. He doesn't really know exactly what it means. He doesn't know what the implications of the vision uh, are. So uh, even though it's been repeated three times, he doesn't seem to understand what's being asked of him. Um, and even still, and this is a, I think this is a, one of the things that makes verse 19 so interesting. It says, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, still sitting there pondering, the spirit basically um, steps in. So just like the spirit had to step in with Cornelius, the spirit now is going to step in. And, and basically, God is not going to wait for Peter to get his act together. I mean, that's kind of the way it feels. He's going to be moved along in his story because things are in motion, and this thing's going to happen, and you need to get on board. I mean, that's kind of the way it sounds. Uh, I feel like I've heard that speech before. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the Spirit will not let, will not allow Peter to hesitate, right? Um, rather, the, speed, the Spirit now gives a straightforward direction, but doesn't yet really fully unfurl, you know, um, interpret for Peter the vision. Uh, it says here in verse 19, look, three men are searching for you. Now get up, go down, and go with them without hesitation, for I have sent them. Right, so you can ponder about the sheep and the animals. <clears throat> You're not going to be pondering about this. We're now back to the same kind of instruction that Cornelius got, um, and so God is going to see this thing through. And as I mentioned uh, already, right, uh, and, and this is something I thought was very interesting. All of these um, uh, in the Greek have very intensive; um, they have intensive uh, prefixes on them, which means that um, that Peter is greatly puzzled. He is he, he is um, flummoxed, right? Um, he's um, people are you know when when people are asking, there, there's an intensive like they they're imploring, they want to know, right? Um, he's still thinking about it, um, and, and the text says, "Do not hesitate." So these are all sort of the drama, in other words, of the scene is 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 there, in, particularly in the language. So what does Peter do? Um, even though Peter does not obey the first vision because he doesn't know what is being asked of him, really, he does obey the second one. Right? He, he obeys the second set of instructions. Uh, and it says here, right, uh, so Peter went down to the men and said, I'm the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they give him an answer. They tell him about Cornelius. They tell him uh, that they've been sent to find him. So uh, Peter obeys. Um, and we're given a redescription, essentially, of who Cornelius is. 
that we're already familiar with now uh, and that we already know. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting, particularly this uh, 23A, uh, so Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. <clears throat> this is interesting because these people are probably Gentiles themselves, right? So Peter uh, is already, in a sense, leaning into what we're about to see, um, which is the overcoming or the removal of the barrier between Jew and Gentile. Right? He's bringing them into the house. Um, now, this, of course, giving of hospitality, those kinds of things, that would be expected of any righteous person uh, in the ancient world. That was something that you did. Um, but the fact that there's a Jew-Gentile distinction here, even though it's not mentioned, it's almost sort of a foreshadowing of what's coming, uh, Peter's act here. Then we get this second paragraph, right? The next day, they get up and they go. Uh, uh, Peter travels with uh, this family, or this, uh, excuse me, not family, but uh, companions to the family of Cornelius. Um, 23b and 24 reads as follows. The next day he got up and went with them, and some of the believers from Joppa accompanied him. So a crew of people go with him. And the following day they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. So uh, we have now a new arrival, right? It parallels the other arrival when Cornelius' people arrive. Uh, to Peter, one thing happens, and now we're going to get a, a same thing. Um, a crowd has gathered, is what the text tells us, because there's something that they expect. Some, some sort of expected thing is going to happen. I think it would be fair to say, though, that no one really knows what's about to happen. Cornelius probably doesn't really know what's about to happen. Cornelius' friends and family, they don't know what's about to happen. Peter doesn't really know what's about to happen. But they all, in faith and obedience, are moving towards the same spot. And that's sort of the image that you're given. And, and they're all obeying differently, perhaps. But nevertheless, they're doing so. And something explosive is going to occur. And that's, uh, but before, of course, that happens, we have to have Cornelius be a Gentile for a second. And what I mean by that is uh, uh, this, these verses 20, 25 and 26. On Peter's arrival, Cornelius met him and falling at his feet, he worshiped him. But Peter made him get up saying, stand up, I'm only a mortal. <clears throat> that's, this is one of those places where there's a sort of a nuance in the way that the language uh, uh, comes through in the Greek, at least implication-wise, uh, because Cornelius here is doing the thing that Gentiles always sort of do, which is idolatry, right? He welcomes him and worships him or offers him a kind of, uh, this at least is the way that most commentators interpret this. Um, and this act of worship of Peter would have, of course, been deeply offensive to Peter. So what does he say? He says, get up off the ground, you stupid Gentile. I mean, basically, that's what he's saying. Stop being a Gentile. You're being, a, you know, that's kind of the way it comes through. Um, and so Peter's words uh, could convey a sense of disgust at this action. Um, and as I mentioned uh, already, he's doing what a typical Gentile uh, would be thought to, to always do, which is to commit idolatry. But Quickly, that turns. This, this is where at 27, um, uh, you get this sort of very interesting, you know, we're going to leave that behind for a second and move forward uh, past this offense. And as he talked with them, he went in and found that many had assembled. <clears throat> and he said to them, you yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Now may I ask why you sent for me? I think it would be fair to say this is the point when the vision is beginning to sink in for Peter, right? Uh, because now he's starting, to, he's starting to repeat the things that he saw in the vision, even if he doesn't still fully know what he's supposed to do. I mean, his question at the end is, what is it exactly that you want? Conveys to us that 
everyone's kind of gathered together and none of them really knows why. <laughs> uh, but God knows, right? And that's what's got it. That's what's going to happen here in just a minute. God is going to sort of show why uh, God has brought these people together. Um, Peter states at the outset by walking into the house, he names his uh, the dilemma that he's been put in. He's a lawful Jew. He's an observant Jew, and at least at this time, um, rabbinic tradition argued that Jews should not even go into the houses of Gentiles, right? Um, so he's, he's, in a, he's in a difficult position, but he's acting on faith. He's transgressing something that he thought or thinks is right, and yet he can't, it's like he can't resist the push of God's spirit in this direction. Um, so as I mentioned here, he knows that he's transgressing a dominant reading of the law, that he also knows that there's some deeper thing happening, right? That there's some deeper meaning to God's ways that's uh, unfolding. And so he basically says, what do you want? Why am I here? Uh, and I and I just kind of re rehearse this as, let's get on with this. Like, what is it that you're expecting to hear from me? Um, does Peter think, have an inkling? Maybe at this point he has an inkling that he's, He's going to have to proclaim the gospel to these people, but he doesn't really know yet. So now we turn then to our next scene. And remember, now we're, I think this is now the fifth scene. Uh, so if I get a volunteer as willing to read uh, our passage. All right, Suzanne? He in It's also on the outline, if you, if you, yeah, yeah, it's also on the outline. <laughs> yeah, there you go, all right. Um, so, so now we get, right, it shifts, right? So now, now Cornelius stands up and, uh, and he essentially in verses 30 through 32 rehearses what we already know, what we've already heard from the vision um, effectively, right? And I think if you pause for a second, uh, you think about the very extraordinary <clears throat> circumstances that have led to this moment, that have led uh, Peter and Cornelius and this whole family to encounter one another in this profound way, in a way that would be illegal on some level, right? Uh, uh, um, and yet, something's about to unfold. And then, excuse me, in verse 33b, um, we get an, an, an interesting and I think helpful addendum, right? So now all of us are here in the presence of God. So listen to all that the Lord has commanded you to say. Here is Cornelius the Gentile naming what Peter probably also is thinking, perhaps, but hasn't spoken, which is that God has orchestrated this whole thing. <coughs> Excuse me. So, all of us are here in the presence of God. What has transpired has done so um, by God's initiative, and what is about to transpire is in God's 
presence, and it's in some sense up to God, in God's hands, we might say. You might have a napkin. <clears throat> Still biting the last parts of that uh, cold, I guess. All right, let me pause and uh, questions, comments, thoughts. Um, I'm going to run out of material before you know it. So take your time. That's never happened. I know. Um, um, Christian? Yeah. When when the people are reading in the room, I can't hear them on the mic. Are they using the mic? No, there's no mic for them to use. Oh, I got it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Tom, go ahead. Well, I just I just had a thought. It says, uh, Cornelius says to Peter, uh, we're here in the presence of God to listen to all that the Lord has commanded you to say. And I don't, did the God give Peter any words other than just go and be and eat? No. Peter must be shocked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I, 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 I honestly feel like uh, until we get right up, literally to the doorstep of the event, and I don't even mean the doorstep of Cornelius's house because he's already inside the house. I don't really think Peter has fully put together what's about to happen, but he, of course, he does. Now he sort of begins to speak, um, but his speaking. I, I, I'll, I'll come back to this. I don't want to. I don't want to say what I have to say. Okay. Until okay. That. Yeah, that's great. Tom. Uh, well, just that uh, in verse twenty-eight, just kind of clarifies his business. Um, so, uh, that then, to the Gentiles, but then, you know, all that. <laughs> um, yeah, he starts to show that he's beginning to understand. What's going on? That's well, right. But also, his uh, in the laws is kept a, uh, like you said, forbidding. Uh, uh, That's right. In the law itself. That's right. It was not. It's not. It's not actually in the law itself, but it was part of rabbinic tradition. And at this point in time, there were different schools um, uh, within uh, Judaism that argued differently. Um, over this, but the, the dominant one, I think, would be fair to say, particularly probably, especially in Palestine, was the need to separate oneself from Gentiles. Yeah. And also, uh, England, uh, the no, we, they're just they're they're showing up with shiny clothes, and that's it. They're wearing their Versace. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, it's pop. Yeah, maybe. That, yeah, that's possible. I, I mean, I, I, the, the primary, uh, kind of note that most of the commentators point out is that this is the hour, and uh, one of the hours of prayer. Um, but that's. I mean, I think there's probably all kinds of intertextual, you know, sort of um, elements where they're connecting things, right? Um, so that, and that would certainly make sense because, and that, and that is an image in a way that's picked up in one of the Deuteropauline texts, right? So uh, Ephesians uses this image of tearing down the dividing wall, right, uh, between Jew and Gentile. And how did Jesus do it? By his cross. Right. Um, so that's, yeah, that could be very much connected. Other comments, sir? All right, well, let's move then into, this is basically the last set of bit of text that I have. Uh, so today, kingdom might come, Jeff, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, 
Can I get a volunteer who's willing to read our text? Sure. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, teaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism, that John announced how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins in his name. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and exploring God. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for, bap for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. Okay, <clears throat> so this honestly is really, there's so much interesting stuff happening in this scene. Um, so first of all, um, I think we can say that finally Peter has arrived. He's understood the vision, right? Um, it's clicked for him. But his his preaching, or we might say his theology, um, hasn't fully caught up to um, his feet, maybe we would say, okay? So starting in verse 34 and 35, uh, then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality. That verse, um, that little quote there, um, has oftentimes been lifted up as the message of Acts, the whole of Acts. Uh, that one little passage there, I truly understand that God shows no partiality. God is interested in and after all people. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. So uh, this little initial start um, is Peter now, uh, I think, finally beginning to internalize, metabolize, we might say, the vision and the meaning of the vision that he had on Simon Tanner's roof. Um, he, he is beginning to understand, in other words, the cosmic implications of uh, the life and the death and resurrection of Jesus. Interestingly, though, his sermon doesn't show that just yet, right? And so God is going to have to do what? Intervene in the middle of him speaking, that his words, um, they, don't care, it's like they don't carry quite enough just yet of the meaning. Um, he turns and begins with this very interesting verse, verse 36, which um, most of the commentators describe as a, as a grammatically difficult verse. Uh, it's difficult to render it in English and to precisely know um, every, like kind of where everything uh, fits here. Uh, but it's really a remarkable path, a little, little verse here. It says, you know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ 
He is Lord of all. The first thing is that I, I, I just want to uh, draw attention to is this idea of preaching peace, right? And peace here, of course, is not simply the absence, right, of conflict. It, it's shalom, right? And, and shalom carries with it the connotation of wholeness, of fullness, of restoration. And that's the kind of peace that's imagined. Obviously, it also echoes all the way back to the very beginning of Luke's gospel narrative um, in chapter 2, where the angel comes and speaks to right, the, uh, um, uh, the, the shepherds in particular. That's the passage that I've uh, highlighted there. Um, uh, peace on earth, right, and goodwill towards, uh, towards humanity. Um, Shalom, then. Uh, is is uh, what was preached through Jesus. Uh, this was the meaning uh, of his life. Um, and you could easily over kind of kind of skim along and, and kind of just register it as just religious language um, that Jesus is Lord of all. This is a highly political statement in this time, right? Lord of all is not um, uh, just a religious statement. It is a political statement. And, and Peter is uttering it where? In the house of a Roman soldier. There is only one Lord of all for a Roman, Caesar, right? To say that Jesus is Lord of all would have been perilous, right? And so uh, that in and of itself is a kind of transgression, you know, in a sense. Uh, and it means, in a way, uh, it, it sort of opens up for us the idea that Cornelius is going to have to leave something behind when he comes in to, to the faith, right? Uh, just as much as the church itself is going to have to leave behind its closed offness uh, in this new reality. Then we get the, the sermon itself in verses 37 through 43. And I'm going to read this in part because uh, most of the commentators uh, that I was looking at argued that this was that they think that this is probably a condensed um, statement of the basic pattern of the early church's preaching. That this gives you the content of what most of the early church uh, uh, preachers, uh, et cetera, would have spoken about. This is the way they would have talked about Jesus. So. <clears throat> that message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So uh, the first thing. I want to, I'm going to highlight basically two observations. The first is that this is considered to be probably one of the most well-developed and concise statements of the early preaching uh, of the church that Luke is probably drawing on here uh, in this uh, telling of the story. Um, and basically the narrative itself rehearses um, uh, Jesus' life, um, and draws in uh, the idea, right, that Peter and others were witnesses of this, but also that the prophets had testified to it, so that it connects, right, to the promises that God made to Israel. What, however, is missing from this message? That's also important. And what is missing is that there's no mention whatsoever that these promises are also meant for Gentiles. Right? It starts out that God sent to the Jewish people, 
And by the time we get to the end, we've been commanded to proclaim forgiveness to the people, presumably the Jewish people. Maybe not. Maybe we don't. It's hard to get into Peter's mind. But Peter does not have, in other words, a kind of theological, well-developed sensibility about what this means. So there's nothing said here, number one, about the inclusion of the Gentiles, nor does he say anything about the giving of the promise of the Spirit, right, which he himself would have already experienced if we go back to Pentecost. Right? So, at this very moment, right, um, both of those two realities are about to break in independently of the words of the church. And this is one of the things that I think is so remarkable about this scene, um, is that God is about to do something that the church is not prepared to do. Right? That's what happens, uh, starting in verse 44. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, <clears throat> for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water of baptism for these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they invited him to stay for several days. There's a lot going on even there, right? These uh, uh, four or five verses here are just chock full of uh, extraordinary things. The first thing, of course, is that God interrupts. This is probably the most important thing, right? And I think, in a way, this is the bookend. Right. Uh, if the, if the, if this whole entire drama started with God visiting Cornelius and ordering him, then it now comes to an end with God intervening and baptizing, giving this gift of the Spirit. Right. Um, so, unlike earlier examples, and in fact, all of the earlier examples that we have in the Book of Acts, at least. Uh, Peter, or whoever it is that's preaching, gets to finish their message um, before God decides to act. Uh, in this case, God simply acts, simply intervenes, uh, drops in. Um, and I, I, I can't uh, stress enough for us today what this means, because what it means is that we don't control the Spirit. We don't control the Spirit. We don't have control of the Spirit. Um, we don't get to decide who gets the Spirit, who doesn't get the Spirit. We don't decide who gets to come in or who doesn't get to come in. God makes those decisions, right? That's what we start to see here, uh, in a sense, right? Uh, is it Peter? Is it Paul? Is it the church? And you could be led, right? I mean, Simon Magus thought he could buy the ability to give the Spirit. Because he thought Peter or whoever controlled it. No, that is not what we see happening uh, all along in our narrative. And this one in particular really uh, resoundingly screams that at us. And then in verses 45 and 46, I mean, it would be hard. It would be hard not to see the response of Peter's companions as completely flummoxed. They're, they are literally astonished, right? Peter hasn't even said anything about Gentiles in the giving of the Spirit, and all of a sudden the Spirit has been poured out on them, and they're watching this happen for us, right? It's happening right in front of them. And so the response to the scene is, I, I think it would be, is sheer astonishment um, uh, by them. And what does Peter do? Uh, he does what he only what he could do, right? Which is, we, these people should be baptized. They should be brought into the community. They should be formed now and become disciples. I mean, we can't keep them out. Um, and, and that's, of course, what he orders, right? Verses 47 and 48. Can anyone with all the water for baptizing these people have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. 
right? And that's uh, that's that's the response, in a sense, is the response of inclusion. Um, and then the very last sentence um, is almost as miraculous as, as much of what we've heard, because what does Peter now do as an observant Jew? He stays with Gentiles, right? Um, he, he he fully crosses over. Um, he, he stands on this event. He stands on this action. Uh, perhaps, perhaps he'll start to reflect on, on passages and texts after the fact. But uh, in the moment, that's not what's happening. So uh, uh, the vision then has clearly sunk in, <clears throat> and it's almost as much of a miracle that Peter stays with them uh, as the rest of it. And in fact. The church in Jerusalem is going to object precisely not to the idea that they got the spirit, but that he stayed with them. Think about that. Yeah. Staying with, with people who could have arrested him and whatever, you know, murdered him. Right. I mean, he came in here. Not just any Gentile, right? A Roman soldier. Exactly. And it's, it's, it's truly remarkable to sit with this scene. And think about what it would have meant for Peter and for the church's imagination about who it was supposed to be in the world. Because it's being completely renovated, in a sense, and opened up to something new and scary on a certain level. And I think some of what we see as we move through the rest of the narrative is the sort of give and take of negotiating that, perhaps. Um, Former understandings are going to have to be encountered and interpreted, et cetera, et cetera. So God doesn't just like do something, bowl everybody over and says, get, you know, get your act together or whatever. There's going to be time. It's going to take some time. Um, it's interesting. Uh, in the video, that the and so, yeah, so the, in our SV, yeah, put pulls in. Uh, it pulls, is it, did, very, yeah, that is very interesting. I wonder if that's based on a different set of um, a different Greek text, if there was some sort of a, an update or something. But also, you know, they're saying that not just any Gentiles, but Gentiles like, become part of the family. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. When does the sign of being a Christian not depend on being a Um, I'm not sure that it ever depended on speaking in tongues. So well, this one was, you know, they were, they were, the spirit came upon them, and the sign was that they believed they were speaking in tongues. Like, right. Yeah. They heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. The question of what kind of tongues this would be is so if we if you remember when we went back to Pentecost, tongues there refer to other languages that would have been known. And it wasn't the same kind of experience that Paul describes. So there are two different types. Um, and I'm not sure that it was ever required. Certainly Pentecostal tradition would say it was required. Um, but I'm not sure that that's actually, if that stands up to historical scrutiny, actually. Um, here, I don't know that I, uh, when I was kind of working on the passage, I'm not sure that any commentators really called attention to that. But I, to be honest, I don't think I'm working with a Pentecostal scholar. Um, so that might be why. They're not as attuned to those questions. Yeah. That's right. This is just this is another Pentecost, and and it and it follows on the on the on the Pentecost that happened in Samaria, you know, and and sort of the mini Pentecost of the the eunuch, etc. Yeah. Some traditions, I guess, like the Pentecostal, talk about the Spirit coming upon them and giving them the water, but also baptism in the Spirit, and it seems like. Uh, the baptism in the spirit came before the baptism of the daughter. That's right. Whereas oftentimes you talk about baptism, there have been the opposite. That's right. Yeah. So there, there have been arguments over 
um, the patterns that we see in scripture. Um, and so there are clearly some places where people are initially baptized with water and then the spirit falls. Um, and I would say probably the magisterial churches of like the Orthodox and the Catholic churches would argue that um, the spirit is intermingled with the water. That's their argument. Um, the, uh, there are other traditions, of course, Pentecostal, where they're pulled apart. And, um, and that's predicated, I think, on a tradition that I'm not sure exactly where it starts. Uh, but there's a pretty long tradition going back at least to the Reformation period of the idea of, of two baptisms, that you are baptized first with water, and then you have a second baptism. And sometimes the language, though, of baptism is not necessarily used. So like Wesley, for instance, will talk about a second work of grace. Um, and there are other traditions that will talk about a, a second thing that happens. And the second thing that happens is meant to empower you to live Christian life. It's essential, when, especially if you have infant baptism. Yes. You need another soap. Right. Yeah, you would need. And so it, it could be that it was, you know, in response to that. Uh, but I don't know the history well enough to be able to say that that's, that that's definitely what's going on. One of the things, though, that this does do, though, is it upends the idea that there's a sort of set pattern and that the church has exclusive control of that pattern. Right? And, um, and of course, many Protestant groups loved the, these texts because it enabled them to push back on um, certain sacramental arguments that the Catholic Church was making. Um, so, hold on, just one more. Yeah. I'm interested in that, uh, that Well, it's a complete, I mean, it, it, it really, it, it is a kind of transgressing, a transgressing, right, of what's clean and unclean. And, you know, and you could, you could imagine Luther is being attracted to the horrified, the language of horrified, because uh, something is happening here that is simply not acceptable, right? Um, except that it's going to be acceptable, right, because God does it. So whether or not it prefigures I think it does because we're going to immediately, we're not going to do it today. I can't believe this is. We're almost done. Uh, Jeff, I almost, you know. And, and we're all here, folks. I know. Look at this. Nobody left. We should put a cross there in the <laughs> sanctify this place. There you go. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but because the, the very next scene, Right, which which sort of elongates this story is you know, meanwhile back at headquarters, right? Is that's kind of what it is. And they're like, Well, what are you doing eating the Gentiles? Like what are you know, and they're and they're and I think that it's not like a question of like, Hey, tell us what happened. They're like, What are you doing? Like, <laughs> you're in trouble for doing that. So I do there probably is some, you know, clear foreshadowing in that regard. Whether that was why Luther chose that particular I don't I won't, I don't know for sure, but I think there is, I think the language though, that's what like is worth sitting with, that God was willing to do something that in the eyes of the faithful was just incomprehensible to them, right? And that's the sort of the astonishment of this. Um, it's, and, and of course, it's an initial reaction, right? Over time, the church clearly changes in that regard and and becomes a dominantly gentile phenomenon uh but at this moment this kind of revolution is really extraordinary i think yeah i just another thing to keep in mind is this um this is the story of philip so it's a scenario 
he baptized them, and they preached the gospel, he baptized them, and nothing happened until Peter and John. Right. And that and that's that's one of the reasons why again this story was so I think particularly um, attractive to Protestant because that other story sounds like the authorities have to get involved for things to be legitimate. And what this story shows is like, eh, sometimes not yet. Sometimes not even the authorities know exactly what's going on because because God is really the authority, essentially. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. This is the first 48. There's that kind of a kumbaya moment where Jesus orders them to be baptized. I, I get the thing in my mind of them putting their armor on and then say, hey, Peter, why don't you stay here for a few days? You know, and we're yeah. all have a good time. And I think that's right. I, each other. I think that's right. I think we sort of, you have sort of this initial um I don't want to say that this is the, sort of the first mixed church, um, but there's sort of a foreshadowing here because in just a little bit, I think it's in chapter 12 or 13, we're going to be introduced to a the church in Antioch. And that really is our first sort of bicultural, multicultural church where we have Gentiles and Jews together. Um, but this clearly is foreshadowing that and also setting up why Peter gets into some trouble uh, in, in just a few verses, so, or at least seems to get into trouble. Yeah. 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 So that would certainly be true. Yeah, so there's catechizing or teaching or, yeah, I mean, I think that's right. I think so. Yeah, so there, there, there's a kind of inclusion and now the, that longer work of discipleship. What are the implications for Cornelius now, right, and his family and, you know, these folks? So um, are there any uh, comments from our friends online before I shift this over to our conversation of um, uh, with our question? All right, I don't see any yet, so um, I have a question here. I sent this out to you um, in the email, and I just thought uh, it would be worth sitting with this for a little bit. Uh, as the question reads, the independent activity of the Spirit is on full display in our passage. What does it mean to you that the spirit blows where it will? Now that's a that's obviously a reference to the to a passage in John. Um, uh, so, but but it's this idea of the spirit's independent activity uh, blowing here and there. Uh, you can't capture the wind. Sort of sort of motif is the idea. What does that mean to you? So take about I don't know five six minutes to talk about that and. We'll come back and share, and uh, and our time will be uh, at a conclusion for today. I'll put you guys online in a uh, in a breakout room. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. 